the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a stray dog is nice. She's a push she brought from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, because everybody needs a little push. From the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Welcome, Transformation Talk Network listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged, where we share advice and support from experts in addiction and recovery. I am delighted to have this guest with me today on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. When I brought this show together, Recovery Recharged, I talk about all kinds of addiction and recovery, and this one is labeled a process disorder, and we're today going to talk about gambling. It's not generally considered a mental illness, but gambling disorders are diagnosable, and they are classified as an impulse control disorder. And I don't know about you, but when I get into the, a casino, my impulses are completely out of control. So I want to get a better handle on whether or not I have a serious problem, whether or not you have a serious problem. And then I want to talk about the entire arena of gambling and sports betting because it definitely is on the rise. So the Pushy Broad brought in a gambling expert, and that is a gentleman by the name of Eric Weber. And let me just tell you why I think he's qualified to talk to us today. Eric is a member of Karen Treatment Centers, where he's been a clinician since 2007. He is working specifically right now with adult men and relapse patients, and he is also working in both the primary and extended care settings. He served as clinical supervisor for the men's unit, director of men's relapse, and he's also a certified alcohol and drug counselor, a certified clinical supervisor, and holds a certificate of competency in problem gambling from the Pennsylvania Certification Board. He has a multitude of other qualifications, but these are the ones that we're going to bring to the table today. The Pushy Broad from the Bronx and Recovery Recharged welcomes Eric Weber. Good morning, Eric. How are you? I am fantastic. So glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled. And just before we started the show, you brought something up that I want to bring to the world right away about how prevalent this is. Something current events in the news about sports gambling. Why don't you share that with us briefly? Just last night was watching the evening news and a very prominent, very prominent baseball player, professional baseball player, his translator uh, got in trouble for gambling uh, on games he should not have been gambling on. There's very strict rules in professional sports of what you can gamble on not. And this particular gentleman gambled on things he shouldn't be and apparently used money uh, from the player. That's what the, it's alleging. And this is national news. And I'm sure it's going to be, you know, just more and more conversation about how gambling is become, becoming more problematic and will continue to become more problematic. I think um, gambling's the next epidemic that we're going to be seeing. You know, we had the opiates. It still have the opiate epidemic. This is the new wave coming in. And we see that so prevalently. There are so many commercials on television that make gambling so seductive with very famous celebrities advertising these things. Tell us a little bit about that. What's your personal feeling around this? Uh, personal feeling is I got tired of it years ago. Um, I think, you know, throwing a little data against the wall to show the magnitude of this. Back in 2019, um, online gambling spent about $154 million that year total, $154 million. In 2020, with the pandemic, that went one um 154 million to uh move the decibel point over they added a zero i mean just 10 times the amount year after that multiplied that uh sports betting last year spent over a billion dollars in advertising over a billion, billion dollars in advertising you said just advertising 
And so you say in in what four or five years we've gone from 154 million dollars total to up to 500 and some odd million dollars to a couple of years later to over a billion dollars a couple of years later. And that's, you know, they're not losing money on those advertising. That money's coming in. That's getting paid for. So it, it gives an idea of what the new is in, in gambling across the board. I mean, if you look at the, the revenue across the nation, I think it was last year, um, $60 billion or something you've seen like that. I mean, it was an obscene amount of money that that gambling generated. Um, and, and all of that is taxable. And this is just the legal stuff. This isn't illegal. This is just legal stuff. Right. And so, you know, somebody said nobody wins. Nobody wins in gambling. And a friend of mine said, well, the government does. They get to tax it. You know, and I'm not a cynic. I'm not. Well, maybe a little bit. I'm not a conspiracy theory. But when you take a look at those numbers. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. It's very impressive. And not only that, but it's not only the advertising that happens on the media, but how convenient it is to place a bet. I was completely enthralled by the fact that I could buy my lottery tickets through my phone, which was never, you know, you were never allowed to do that. But I think COVID, no matter what, has also generated a tremendous amount of alcoholics and addicts. And Dr. Pat and I always talk about the fact that that alcohol sales and everything has increased during that time during isolation. But it also made made technology so much more advanced that everything is right on your phone. So it's not not only those advertising, but all the apps, like all the famous betting places, betting parlors, and the fact that you can plug into a Vegas casino anytime you write, you like, right? From your phone. Absolutely. I'm talking to you on a potential casino. And, <laughs> it, it, and it's interesting. One, one, of the things, one of the things I'm seeing as a treatment provider, especially among the younger crowd, the young adults, the college students, uh, and this is a crowd that's extremely vulnerable to gambling addiction extremely vulnerable because it's peer supported. Um, everybody's doing it. They get a credit card and it feels like a video game when it's, when it's online, just feels like a video game. I remember being a kid. I'm old enough to remember Tetris when it first came out, you sit there, crank up the stereo, eat Doritos and you play Tetris, but you paid for the game once cost you 1599. You plugged it in. You could play as much as you want versus I'm playing roulette or I'm playing blackjack and it costs me money every time I, I lose a hand. Right. And I've got these young folks who are like, look, I got my computer, my laptop, and my phone, and I'm playing three different tables at the same time. And they're losing or winning, but losing that money that quick. And it doesn't feel like they're losing money because when you and I went to the casino years ago, I had to peel out a hundred dollar bill and hand it to somebody. Now it's a swipe of a credit card. It's like going on Amazon. I don't realize how much I spend until I get the bill, the credit card bill, and I go, Right. And you're absolutely right. And I think the analogy of making it feel like a video game makes it extremely enticing and a lot of fun to watch. And and if nothing else, completely mesmerizing. And that's where I want to go for the moment. OK, that that being mesmerized, that that how it affects the excitement of my body and it, it and affects my brain. Let's talk a little bit about the science of gambling and how it does affect the body and the brain. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. When we talk about the effects on the brain, um, they've done some functional MRIs on people who were shown uh, visual stimulus of gambling. And so they started measuring um, brain activity in the limbic system, the prefrontal cortex, the frontal cortex for people who didn't like biology. That's basically the pleasure center and the control center and how the control center starts to shut down and the pleasure center starts really pulsating. It's like a Christmas tree woo, lights up. Right. And so just like if if we didn't know what was stimulating, it would look the same as if somebody was drinking, doing cocaine or or doing other narcotics. It just lights up the brain. And so the brain doesn't know the difference. The brain just knows, hey, I'm getting stimulated. Dopamine gets released and it feels good. The problem is somebody who's predisposed to addiction, limbic system gets dysregulated and we're off to the races. And from a biological standpoint, the brain reacts the same way. So when people say, well, look, I don't get it. Can't you just stop? That's like asking an alcoholic, can't you just stop? No, right? And so it, it has that same physiological response, especially we start taking a look at the neuroscience, start t- taking a look at pictures of somebody's brain. 
You're absolutely right. And I know what it's like for me being a recovering addict and alcoholic. When I walk into a casino, I get that excitement. I get that intense, you know, my blood starts to get excited and I start to breathe heavy. And then I am not interested in anything anybody has to say except the flashing lights and and pulling a lever or putting money or rolling dice, right? And I always feel like it's a total and complete escape, just like I did when I was using, right? I have intense cravings to go back. If I'm staying in a hotel with a casino, all I'm concentrating on is that casino. And the more I get away from it, the more I feel pangs if I want to go back. So there's a withdrawal sense as well. So it really does go and mimic every single thing that happens in the addictive brain. So how do I know if I have a gambling problem? What are the warning signs that people want to know about gambling addiction? What should we look I at? Think, yeah, I think you just gave us a whole bunch. I mean, you gave your, your, your subjective, um, you know, experience of what does withdrawal feel like if somebody has obsession and compulsion i'm thinking about it and once i start i can't stop unmanageability other parts of my life are starting to get damaged because i can't stop this money is going missing i'm spending money i shouldn't be spending i'm lying about it i'm hiding it uh i've got shame about it um parts of my life work family are getting ignored or left behind those are all signs of a problem happening um, you know, lots of behavior. Somebody says, well, you know, what is addiction? It's obsession, compulsion. It's paralysis, unmanageability. Can I stop when I want to stop? Do I go too far? And can I stop in the face of consequences? Or do I keep going despite negative consequences? They're all things that people should be taking a look at. I think with, with especially online gambling, the relationship with technology is also very important. I was just at a conference last week and they were talking about this very significantly, that it's not only just if you have a problem with gambling, stopping gambling, but also what's your relationship with your technology, your phone, your computer, your, your, your laptop, um, how much engagement do you have in that? Because those things have become so ubiquitous in our lives. I used to make calls, to communicate, to pay bills, to, to check on friends, all these things we need our, our, our electronics for. And that electronic is also the gateway to, you know, the addiction, right? It's like saying, hey, Alan, as a recovering alcoholic, we, the only chance you have to eat is go to the bar and eat, but don't drink. That's what we're asking. And that sounds ridiculous. And yet that's the struggle folks coming into recovery from gambling problems are facing. So based on the conference, tell us a little bit about the conference and what you've gleaned from it so we can learn. Sure. Uh, the conference was the Pennsylvania State Conference for Gambling. They do it every year. Um, had some great speakers come in. And one of the things that struck me was, particularly with sports betting, right? And I know that's a big thing right now, particularly with sports betting, how sports betting has changed drastically in the past number of years because of online and what we're calling micro bets. Used to be I put 100 bucks in the Super Bowl. I had to wait for the Super Bowl. I had to wait for it to be over and see if my team won. Delayed gratification. Now there's parlays, which means I'm going to bet on several things to win. And if they all win, I get a huge payoff. If one of them loses, I lose everything. Huge. It's a huge risk for people who really don't know what they're doing, or, or even if they do know what they're doing, the odds are, are big. That's one where a lot of people are losing a lot of money. With the sports betting, the other thing we're seeing is a um, the reward schedule has changed. Instead of having wait to the end of the game, I'm going to bet on coin costs, jersey number for the first touchdown, how many yards going to be for the first touchdown, what color the Gatorade's going to be, you know, which is a cheerleader's going to be blonde or more brunette, you name it, we can bet on it, and it's fast, right, it's blackjack on a football field, right, and I'm just using football as an example, you can take any sport and do that, and what's happening is with that increased schedule of reward, people have more dopamine hits and are more likely to get fixated i'm not going to say addicted but at least fixated on it and that is just it's like having the rat that every other time he hits the button he's getting the cocaine versus every 10 times that is so scary eric yeah yeah when it was brought to me in that kind of vivid imagery and presentation i'm like holy cow like that's just really accelerating in an exponential way the problem we're going to be fa are facing and, and will continue to be facing moving forward 
And it hits all of the pressure points for, for yeah. an addict, or at least the propensity to become an addict. And that's yeah. the thing that people don't understand. You could start not caring about gambling at all, right? You don't mm -hmm. have to start out being an abusive gambler to turn into a gambling addict. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, for, mo for a lot of people, gambling is simply a way to increase a little excitement. They're going to walk away from it. And that's great. I've got nothing against gambling in itself. It's the people who are vulnerable to becoming problem gamblers. Those are, the, those are the concern. You know, we don't advertise cigarettes because people get addicted to cigarettes. We, we monitor where you can advertise alcohol because we don't want to, you know, really push something on folks we don't want necessarily want exposed to this. We can't advertise Budweiser in the local elementary school. It's just inappropriate. Exactly. Right? It's just, it's just exactly. inappropriate. So, but we have all these advertisements on gambling. And it's interesting in places in Europe, I, and I can't remember the exact country, I think Spain and somewhere else, they've actually limited gambling advertisements during sporting events because they recognize they want people paying attention to the sporting event, not getting triggered to do more gambling. They've recognized this, that this is a problem already. There's a couple of countries in Europe where they've taken some proactive steps. And, you know, it's, it's a question I think we're going to have to ask ourselves here in the States, it's we're the same, like, are we pushing, are we creating a dangerous space for at least a minority group? And do we care about this minority group enough to protect them? And that's also interesting that you say for a couple of reasons. First of all, because one has the propensity to do some great danger. And I'm not so sure that if we keep going in this way, the minority group is going to be a minority. I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold that as, as we're going to wait and see. And you may very well be right. So there are distinct dangers, as we talked about. And I don't think that, that people fully understand how dangerous it could be. Several years ago, I had somebody from Gamblers Anonymous come and speak and talk about the devastating effects of gambling addiction. And I know that in your practice, you've seen some. Let's give people some really hardcore examples of what that looks like. Sure. From a, from a mental health standpoint, people who struggle with gambling addiction are going to be much higher propensity to struggle with um, depression, anxiety. Um, further down the line of gambling addiction, you're going to have um, a higher rate of suicide attempt and suicide completion, um, which is really quite devastating. You're going to have financial ruin. Uh, one of the things that struck me is really a great, a very poignant statement last week at the conference was the gentleman said, look, you used to have a bookie. And if you didn't pay your bookie, he'd break your arm and it'd take about six months to heal. Now the credit cards are your bookies and they're going to ruin your credit score. And that's going to take over 10 years to heal. Do you want six months or 10 years? And I thought it was so interesting because like, oh, I don't want somebody breaking my arm. Now we broke your credit. Now your life is screwed. And oh, so, my God. <laughs> right. And I was like, wow, what a way to put that. And, he's, and there's no it might be a little hyperbole, but it's really true. And so we talk about the damage of gambling addiction, the financial damage that, that families can be in. It's not just me if I'm struggling. It's what kind of financial damage have I done to my family, to my kids? Have I taken their, their college funds, which I hear about? Have I ruined somebody's credit score? Oh, my wife's credit score is now ruined because ours is, is connected if we're married. And she's taking on my debt. And so these are some of the damage. You say, oh, you know, just pay it back. This racks up really quickly and get quite catastrophic in a very short time. And and like you said, the, the consequences are devastating. I'm wondering, in the work that you do, do you find that there is a, a, a gender separation in terms of gambling? Is it more men than women? Is it a different age group? What are you finding demographically? Uh, I can speak to Pennsylvania, and I'll use that as sort of because Pennsylvania has a huge gambling community at this point. Um, just point of fact, in the United States, entire United States, Nevada still has number one revenue for gambling. Pennsylvania is now number two. We beat out Atlantic City and New Jersey. We have the second highest revenue for gambling. We have 13 brick and mortars. We've got sports betting. Gambling is alive and well in Pennsylvania. So what I can tell you is in Pennsylvania, the demographics, which is probably demonstrative of across the country, it, they, every, the highest, the most gamblers look like me, middle-aged men, college educated. 
We have access, we have resources. It used to be a different group, right? It used to look different, but now it is actually folks with resources and access are gambling more and more. Part of it's because it's normalized. It's easy. You know, I don't have to go to the casino. I don't have time for that. I'm busy. You know, but I got time on my laptop, 15 minutes of blackjack between meetings. You can easily do that. I'm on my phone. I'm in the bathroom. I'm going to do a little roulette while I'm, while I'm you know, literally on, on in the bathroom. Um, that, I think, has been a big change. And so when we talk about the demographic, it's still more men than women. Um, and But they look like me instead of other types of folks. Younger people are also becoming more it's becoming more prevalent. And when you see the 1-800-GAMBLER number, the people who are calling that, that demographic is shifting younger. That used to be more of a 30 to 40, 35 to 45 years old. That is shifting down into the 20s and the early 30s because more young people are realizing that they're having problems and they need help. And so when we take a look at the demographic of who's reaching out, that's shifting as well as this epidemic is happening. Well, that seems to take a turn for the positive. And, and I also find in my own personal clients that, like you said, college age kids in between to de-stress to what they think is a de-stressor between exams and between, you know, all of that kind of stuff that goes on in college. It's easy to gamble. I see so many young men, especially having their own poker games, having their own situations, you know, with the guys in the dorm and stuff like that. So that's always a prevalent thing. And I also have a large portion of retirees that have pension money, that have social security money, that want to do something on an afternoon, will take the bus to Atlantic City, or because if they're not particularly computer savvy, at least get together a game, whether it's it's uh, poker or or something else, and, and bet heavily. Yeah, most definitely. I think it's, you mentioned about the stresses of college. One of the things I've noticed um, yeah, here where I work, we had a specialty track for first responders, and I used to get a lot of referrals to see first responders, police, fire, EMTs, and that was a very common way for that particular group to say, look, I have, you know, eight, 10 hours off between shifts. I got to unwind real quick. I'm going to crack a beer, play a bunch of roulette, get some sleep, get up and go again, or they've been on long shifts. And so that was a demographic, a group that I saw highly susceptible to wanting to escape with the college kids, it's the normal. I mean, think I, I think back, you know, 15, 20 years ago when ESPN was was doing Texas Hold'em tournaments. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to learn to play Texas Hold'em. I never heard of that until I saw it on television. And it became popular. So what do I see on television? That's what I'm going to do. I mean, back in the 80s, I started smoking cigarettes. Why? Because I saw it on TV. And the guy looked cool smoking cigarettes. You know, a couple of years later, I'm like, I got to quit. But it, you did it because it looked cool. And so as we have the advertisements as we market it and it looks cool. They don't show anybody losing. They don't show anybody going to jail or going bankrupt on the commercials. Can't imagine why, right? And so to your point, you know, like there's, there's, there's a social aspect to it. With the older generation, I got nothing to do. I remember in the, you know, at the local mall that the older folks, retired folks used to go to the mall and walk laps because it was social and they could get out. Well, now, Nobody goes to the mall anymore. People go to the casino. Going to exactly. be social. Exactly. Yeah, be social. And it's Get the a same field. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it goes through a wide democratic, a democratic. So demographic rather, I'm sorry. Yeah. So now tell me, what can we do about it? How do we treat it? How do you treat it? And is there real help out there? Yes. I think the, the very fine print at the bottom of the advertisements, 1-800-GAMBLER, um, that is a live hotline that is manned by real live people 24-7. Somebody can call that, and it, it's state-specific. So, again, I'm in Pennsylvania. If you call that number in Pennsylvania, they're going to say, how can we help you? Here are some resources. Here are uh, certified counselors. Uh, somebody's family member can call up. doesn't have to be the person struggling with gambling. If your husband's struggling, you can call up as a spouse or wife, whatever. Um, and so there is people like people like myself who are especially trained to work with with gamblers. And we're available through these web through these websites and through these um, help numbers. And we're seeing those numbers increase a lot. There's Gamblers Anonymous, which is a 12 step program designed for folks to be able to get um, support from peers. I think there's you know more and more literature being put out. Um, 
I'm, I'm hoping that society is more supportive than it has been at recognizing it as a problem so that people don't have to walk around with guilt and shame. There's a lot of guilt and shame with gambling addiction because it's treated like some other process addictions, like what's wrong with you. I understand cocaine. I understand getting hooked on opiates. Everybody gets, you know, you know, screwing out painkillers, you know, even marijuana. Like I get it. You get hooked on it. But gambling, really, why can't you stop? Um, I think as we educate people, society can embrace it as more of an issue, as an issue as it is. And then people can say, look, I'm not ashamed to ask for help. And that's the biggest thing is getting over the shame of asking for help. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Like Eric said, 1-800-GAMBLER or Gamblers Anonymous, or find a way to get some help. You can also go to pushybroadfromthebronx.com or call my 800 number, 800-889-1757. I will direct you to resources that can help you. There is no question. Eric, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate everything. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been my immense pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is The Pushy Broad. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This is Ellen Stewart, The Pushy Broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From The Pushy Broad from the Bronx, New York.